So today's guest, I followed his work for a number of years ever since going to Duke repeatedly, actually to the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and, and learning about it there. And I'm so thrilled we can have him today. He's a perfect person to kick off this year's series because he works at this interface of evolutionary biology and mathematical modeling <coughs> and metabolism and complex systems. And this is an exact area where we think there are going to be great advances made. I don't know how many of you are aware that our center is strongly connected with the Santa Fe Institute, and we're going to be mounting a special workshop in February, trying to look at the things that Fred's going to be there as a part of that, trying to look at whether we can understand certain diseases in terms, not of their genetic causes or environmental causes, but in terms of what aspect of a regulatory system is failing, and trying to understand why those regulatory systems are vulnerable to failure. I've been especially interested in Fred's work because I think he has the opportunity to answer this mystery about why any of us are ever healthy, given that we all carry so many mutations. It's a deep, deep mystery. Most doctors aren't even thinking about it exactly. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's profoundly important for medicine as it tries harder and harder to find the genes for diabetes, schizophrenia, autism, and all the rest, and not finding them. We really need a new approach, and I think Fred's approach is what we need. So that's why we're, we've invited someone who's an expert on butterfly wing patterns uh, to kick off the term, other than the fact that so many people here are especially interested in butterflies, wing patterns, and insect evolution in general. I think I won't take any more of his time except to announce a prize or so. And he got a prize from the St. Petersburg Naturalist Society um, last year, the International Kowalski Medal, which I think is quite an amazing achievement. And reading his articles, for those of you who look at his CV or his webpage, I recommend you go back and forth between the ones that are rigorous, mechanistic, looking at mechanisms in an evolutionary light, and those where he allows himself to wax more philosophical and try to give us a perspective on how to think differently about these systems using an evolutionary framework. Fred, we're so glad you're here. Oh, thanks so much, Randy. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks for the very generous introduction. That was very nice. I hope I can live up to that someday. Um, so, so here's, here's my title, that was what was on the poster, it comes with a subtitle, and it's really work that I and my, my friend and colleague Mike Reed in, the math, in our mathematics department have been doing for about the f last 15 years or so. We've been having a very close collaboration, we and about a dozen collaborators that, will, that I will acknowledge at the end, um, in which we've been working on what we call large metabolic systems with well-established roles in health and disease. We've done a lot of work on one carbon and glutathione metabolism, which probably is a mystery to you, but I'll, I'll tell you what that's all about. Uh, dopamine and Parkinson's, we, don't, we continue to do quite a bit of work, collabor and collaboration on serotonin and how SSRIs really work. We've done work on arsenic detoxification. We've done quite a bit of work on uh, modeling on acetaminophen toxicity. I will spend most of my time today actually working about this, about this first, working on this, this first topic. I'll touch briefly on serotonin, I'm oh, sorry, on dopamine and Parkinson's, and if there's time at the end, I'll tell you a scary story about, about acetaminophen. Uh, large metabolic systems, this, this is what I mean by a large metabolic system, okay? So the, this is, it's called folate mediated one carbon metabolism. Uh, it's called folate mediated because folic acid is one of the carriers of one carbon units, methyl units. The function of this system is to take in amino acids, which, which come in as serine and glycine, rip them apart in the mitochondria, uh, export methyl groups to the cytoplasm, and these is used to build you know, uh, to methylate different compounds to build larger organic molecules. Okay, um, it's a complex system. Why is it interesting to us? It's been shown through epidemiological and uh, and sort of association studies that defects in this system, either environmentally induced or genetically induced defects in this system, are associated with a whole variety of scary diseases. Uh, megaloblastic anemia being the least one of them. We probably all know about folic acid deficiency and neural tube defects, uh, spina bifida and encephaly, a very strong signal in, signal in colorectal cancer, somewhat less so but still pretty powerful co contributor to other cancers, very strong signal in cardiovascular disease associations, and various neurological and affective, affective disorders. Uh, why that should be is what I'm going to start by explaining. And so rather than take this giant diagram, I'm just going to isolate the, uh, sort of the cytosolic version of it. And uh, it's a little bit easier to, to walk our way through. And I'll tell you what this system does, okay? 
Uh, first of all, there is there, 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 there's a reaction here, primarily synthesis reaction and the Eichardt reaction, which are the first steps in the de novo synthesis of purines and pyrimidines. Okay, so this is, this is what you need. If you're not going to recycle your, your nucleotides, this is where they're going to come from. Uh, thymidylase synthase actually controls the rate-limiting step for DNA synthesis. If that reaction does not go fast enough, cells cannot divide fast enough, okay? And if you can block that reaction or a successive reaction, you have a terrific uh, anti-cancer drug. And a lot, of, a lot of chemotherapeutic drugs for cancer block those, block those reactions. Um, on the far side of this diagram is represented here is DNA methyltransferase. This is where uh, methylation of DNA and histones occur. And so this is where epigenetic regulation occurs. Uh, if things go wrong there, you might get misregulation of, of, of gene expression. At the bottom of this pathway is glutathione synthesis. Glutathione is the largest, the principal endogenous antioxidant uh, that we produce. The liver produces prodigious quantities of this. If something goes wrong at this downstream part, uh, of the pathway, one becomes susceptible to a variety of oxidative uh, diseases. Okay. So here's what happens when, when it goes wrong. So DNA synthesis and repair, I just mentioned, I told, it, I told you these enzymes are the targets for anti-cancer drugs. If they are misregulated, you can get runaway uh, cell division, or you can get insufficient cell division, uh, which then leads to these neural tube defects. Uh, again, defects um, in DNA methylation and, and epigenetics are associated with cancer, are associated with aging, or at least with, uh, with senescence. Uh, there is an amino acid here, homocysteine. It's a rare amino acid. It's highly reactive. It's normally there at vanishingly small, small concentrations, but there is a defect in the pathway. This can accumulate quite a bit. It uh, reacts severely with a variety of proteins, particularly in the, the vascular uh, lining of, of arteries and it's associated with, uh, with atherosclerosis. Again, glutathione as an antioxidant can protect against that. Uh, glutathione uh, is in, generally, in general associated with uh, relief of oxidative stress. It's involved with the detoxification of heavy metals. Uh, this reaction is this enzyme here, cystathionine beta synthase is on chromosome 21. Uh, in Down syndrome and trisomy, you get misregulation of glutathione synthesis. And some of the symptoms associated with Down syndrome are, uh, are oxidative stress. Uh, there's oxidative stress also associated with, with autism, and that's relieved to some degree with a, a healthy glutathione status. And then several of these reactions are in the first steps of dopamine and serotonin synthesis, and defects in those reactions are contributors to a variety of psychiatric psychiatric disorders. So you can see the, that there are lots of things going on here, and that is why these, this pathway has been exceptionally well studied. These associations have been known for 40 or 50 years already. Whole careers have been spent studying little, each of the individual enzymes. Not only whole careers, people have gotten into the National Academy working on that thing. Um, with all their postdocs and all their graduate students, okay? And so what we've been trying to do is to put it all together and see, you know, see if we can make sense of the system as a whole rather than to understand the individual contributions of the bits and pieces, okay? Spina bifida, we don't need to look at this for a very long time, a nasty birth defect, that is what really got, got, the, whole thing, got the whole thing going. Uh, spina bifida is, uh, comes, due, comes about due to a deficiency in folic acid. Here's a mouse embryo where the dark stain is staining the, uh, the folic acid transporters. Okay, so this is during dorsal closure of the, of the, of the embryo, where cells, you know, the, normally the neural tube starts off a, as, a, as a flat sheet, and the cells at the ridges divide like crazy and come together to form the neural tube. If that cell division cannot happen rapidly enough in terms of folic acid deficiency, the ends don't meet. Okay? And depending on where the zippering, that zippering occurs, and it starts, this is from a mouse embryo, it can start near the, you know, near this, near the cleft palate, you get a cleft palate syndrome, or you get anencephaly if the zippering doesn't occur uh, correctly here. Or if it doesn't occur correctly farther back, you would get spina bifida. Okay? But all these, you know, cleft palate would be one of the minor uh, conditions, one of the minor symptoms of that. Okay, so that, that was originally why, why that, was, that, was, that was interesting. So this is the system as a whole. It's been known that this cycle, so there's glutathione synthesis, the methionine cycle, the folate cycle, the mitochondrial folate cycle, the general structure of this thing has been known for quite a long time, and as I said, people have focused their careers, you know, with, with sharp focus on individual enzymes and, and reactions. 
Uh, and what Mike and I decided to do is just to see if we could actually put this thing together, you know, because it's been so well studied uh, that we actually know what the structure of the, of the network is, and we actually know the kinetics of each of those reactions. Those are really, really well established. So we don't have to black box anything, even in a complex system with all these interlocking cycles as, as this one. And so what we do, we the, 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 the mathematical models are straightforward. There are differential equations, one for each metabolite that tells you how it is made and destroyed. And each of these Vs is a kinetic equation that could be something as simple as a michaelis menten equation, but again, sometimes they're a little bit hairier because there are lots of co-activators and, and co-inhibitors of these reactions that the, system, that the system depends on. Again, we don't have to make this up. We can get the structure of the, of the kinetics from the literature, and we can get the value of the kinetics constants from the, from the literature. Okay? So the system, this system is subject to both genetic variation and environmental variation. So the environmental inputs into the cycle are, first of all, the amino acids, the serine, glycine, cysteine, and methionine, which serve as the methyl donors, uh, essentially. And then there are the B vitamins, the B, several of the B vitamins, B6, B12, uh, folic acid is, is vitamin B9. Everywhere where there's a pink box is the folic acid playing a role. Um, these folates, they, these uh, uh, B vitamins act as, um, as cofactors for the enzyme. So if you have a, a deficiency in B12, for instance, then methionine synthase simply cannot run as fast as it ought to. And similarly with these, with these, other, with these other enzymes. So having a sufficient protein intake, having a sufficient vitamin B12, uh, vitamin, uh, B vitamin status is absolutely critical to keep these reactions going correctly. Where do we normally get these vitamins from? You ought to be getting them from food, right? Folic acid we normally get from green leafy vegetables. You know, folic acid gets its name from folium, you know, leaf. Um, that's the only, the only source of it. Vitamin B12 we typically get from eating meat. Uh, it's made by bacteria in our guts, and most of us have, don't have a healthy enough flora to provide quite all the vitamin B12 that we need, so we tend to get it from, from steak. Um, in reality, this is really where we get it from. We get it from by taking our, our multivitamins uh, every day. And folic acid we actually get mostly and adequately from eating uh, folic acid fortified cereal products, you know, breads, donuts, uh, whatever. Since about 1998, the, uh, all cereal products in the United States have by law have been fortified with folic acid. And that has reduced the incidence of spina bifida to somewhere between 20% to 60% lower than it used to be before that, that fortification. It's one of the most successful sort of interventions with our, you know, legal interventions with our, with our food chain that, that we have experienced. Um, and so, so it's in our food. The reason why it's in our food and why women don't, aren't, uh, don't, aren't just recommended to, to just take a folic acid dose when they're planning to get pregnant is because that dorsal closure and the embryo happens during about the third week of pregnancy, typically before a woman knows she's pregnant. Uh, and so if you don't start taking folic acid until after you're pregnant, it's way too late. Okay? And so this is why we get this, this, this you know, this, this is why, why I take, I kept my good dose of folic acid, not because I'm likely to get pregnant, but this sort of helps everybody else. Okay? So in addition to these environmental factors, right, dietary factors that affect the, the proper running of this cycle, uh, we have high frequency, big effect functional polymorphisms in a lot of enzymes in this cycle. Right? A lot of the, the, the genes for these enzymes and all the ones that I've indicated with, with dark, uh, dark circles here have a ton of genetic variation in human populations and, 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 and variations alleles with, with very large effects. And by what I mean by large effects, is this here. So this is just, oops. Oh, it won't walk about. Okay, so this will show up. Um, so here are for one, two, three, four of these, of these enzymes, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're SNPs, uh, and here's the activity to which they affect the, the wildcat of the enzyme. So they, they, they depress the activity of the, of the enzyme by quite a bit, down to 30% of normal, 24% of normal, 13% of normal. So these, this is what I mean by big effect mutations. They really have a severe effect on the activity of the gene product, okay? And they're high frequencies. These are not rare. 
in different populations, you can see these occur at tremendous frequencies. You know, for this one, you might argue which is the wild type allele. It's, it's, it's actually in, in U.S. Caucasian populations. This particular deletion is, is more common than the, than, than the wild type. But it is associated, again, statistically, statistically with disease. So each one of these has, the reason we know about these is because of epidemiological and association studies that associate them with increased incidences of these various diseases that I showed you on that first, on that first slide. And so we began to wonder, um, you know, if this correct operation of this folate-mediated one-carbon metabolism is so important, and defects associated with it are associated with so many diseases, then how do we tolerate that many mutations at such high frequencies in our population? And it turns out it's not just the chemistry. You cannot get that information from just the diagram, from just the network. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes than the standard reaction diagrams that we learn in, in, in biochemistry. It turns out that this whole system, and here's sort of a projected view of that, is crisscrossed with what we call allosteric regulatory interactions, where metabolites in one part of the system act as allosteric activators or inhibitors of enzymes somewhere totally else in the system. So the whole system is crisscrossed with these regulatory, regulatory interactions. And these are the things that evolved to provide stability to the system and to provide protection against both environmental variation and against a genetic variation. I'm going to show you why we think that is the case. Oh, and there's one additional level. So there's a diagram I just showed you. Oh, some of these metabolites uh, are also transcriptional regulators. So there's a DNA plane of the genes that produce the, that produce the enzyme. So, so, so there are layers and layers of regulation in the system which you normally don't learn about when you learn, when you learn biochemistry. Okay. Now, in order to analyze that, uh, I have to tell you what, what we think uh, are the, the critical phenotypes in the system, okay? Because it's, 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 it's all biochemistry, and all these, this whole system is in service of things that I've already mentioned, actually. There are these two reactions, the ICARD and the thymidylate synthase reaction, which are the, uh, the rate-limiting steps for nucleotide synthesis. There are these DNA methyl and histone methyl transfer reactions, methylation reactions, and there's glutathione synthesis. So in, in what follows, I'll call these sort of the critical phenotypes of the system. This is what this, is what this thing is designed to produce, okay? And all of this, this machinery is in service of that. Okay, so we've written these mathematical models for, 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 these, these, uh, for, for the system. And once you have a mathematical model, uh, we validate it. You know, we collaborate with a lot of clinicians, we collaborate with experimentalists, uh, we continually validate the model against new data. We test the model against data that our collaborators produce and see can the model actually reproduce that experiment or can it reproduce this set of clinical data. I'll show you some examples of that as we, as we go along. Um, and over the years, this model has been developed well enough that we can, we can do about 95% of anything that has been ever been observed clinically or experimentally in the system. So we're very confident that we have a model that is a really good flight simulator for this. You know, for this, for, for this bit of metabolism at least. Which means that we can do experiments with the model now that might, you cannot do ethically or physically on people. So we can ask questions about it. What happens if this happens? So one thing that we can do with the model is we can feed it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, you have just had lunch. Uh, this system is never at steady state, right? You have just taken in amino acids and, a, and, 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 and some vitamins. And what that is doing to your liver, it is yanking some of these reactions go, you know, the, the, the rates of those reactions, because amino acids are the inputs to the system, vary by several hundred percent, and some of them even reverse direction. The metabolite concentrations vary by, you know, 50 to 100 uh, percent the, in the liver and, 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 and in the blood. And this is all in service of these four, these four clinical reactions. They hardly vary hardly vary at all. They're rock steady, even in the face of tremendous variation uh, in the guts and the mechanics of the system. So this is the, so, so, so this is what we call dynamic stability, right? So the, these, are, these guys are stable, but they're only stable because there are reactions that maintain that stability in the face of variation in, in, in input by, by our breakfast, lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, 
How do we know that that is the case? Well, if we take, for instance, one of those allosteric interactions that I showed you from the diagram, and in the, in the mathematical model, we just turn it off. We just say, well, suppose that, that, that feedback interaction doesn't exist. And when we do that, we, instead of, uh, of getting this, if we here we, we eliminate one of, the, one of the feedback interactions, and now, instead of DNA methyl transferase having only slight variation with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it gets much larger cells. Now, it's important for this to be a pretty stable reaction because cells are continually dividing. Every time a cell divides, uh, it's, it, it, the, 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 new, the new DNA needs to be methylated correctly at each cell division. So as cells are dividing, you have a tremendous uh, need for methyl groups to appear at the right time, at the right amount, to do that, to do that, to do that methylation. So you can't just allow that reaction to vary with input of methyl groups. It has to be absolutely rock steady, or at least reliably steady. Okay. Um, so that is sort of the acute, you know, the system is, is stable in those reactions at least to acute variation in, in input, okay. It is also for quite stable to long-term uh, input. So this is the dihydrofolic reductase reaction. Ooh, let me see where that, I'll show you the reaction where that lives. It's, uh, it's this reaction, dihydrofolic reductase. It's, it's in line with thymidylate synthase reaction. It's one of the targets of chemotherapeutic drugs. Uh, Ephotrexate is a target for the drugs. And it's been known for quite a long time that if you start a chemotherapeutic treatment with methotrexate, it takes rather large doses and rather a long time for, that, for the effect to kick in. And so within the model, we can say, well, suppose that you know, we, we know what the normal Vmax of this enzyme is. Let's start suppressing the activity of that enzyme progressively and see what happens to the velocities of various reactions or to metabolite concentrations within this network. And you can see nothing much happens. You can depress the activity of that enzyme to 20% you know, of, of its normal value. You don't see a difference in the reaction rates. Okay? So, this, so, so this is how much variation you can tolerate. Once you get much less than that, once you get to about 10% of the activity, now you're beginning to see a slight effect and then you very rapidly drop off the cliff. The point is that this system is horribly sensitive to, vari to, to variation in that particular enzyme. It doesn't really care, okay, as long as there's some of it, okay? And if, if there's too much of it, it doesn't matter either because oh, you're, you're, on, you're on this plateau, okay? So that's one of the, well, one of the stabilizing uh, mechanisms in this. Another one that we ran into, a stabilizing mechanism, which, which uh, we thought initially was a bit curious, uh, is called substrate inhibition. So normally in, when you think of a, of, a, of a chemical reaction, if you increase the concentration of the substrate, the reaction will just go faster and faster. It might level off at some point, but it typically goes, just goes faster and faster. In substrate inhibition, what you actually get is a substrate binds to an enzyme, and a second substrate can bind to another location of the enzyme and form an inactive complex. It was actually worked out by, by John Haldane in the 1930s, and instead of having an ever-increasing sort of michaelis menten curve, what you get is as substrate concentration increases, initially the reaction velocity goes up and then it starts to decline, okay? Um, it's a really common phenomenon in biochemistry. It's almost completely neglected in biochemistry courses, but about 20 or 30 percent of the known enzymes uh, experience substrate inhibition. Here's just a list. If you're doing biochemistry, you'll recognize a lot of your friends in here. I won't bother you with that. But here's a consequence for, for folate metabolism. So if we do not have these allosteric regulatory interactions in the system, and we plot a graph of the total folate concentration in the system and, and, and the response to, to, of the velocities of these various reactions in the system, they're almost linear. The more folate you have, the faster the reactions go. But if you have all those regulatory interactions in place, you can vary, the, you know, and, and you can see the, 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 the curves look like those like the substrate inhibition curves, they gradually work down. But within a physiological range of folate concentrations, the reaction rates actually don't change all that much. They're remarkably stable, okay? And this is, again, in, in thanks, to, th thanks to just that one particular feature of, uh, of biochemistry, okay? All right, so this is a, uh, I'm showing, these, showing you these one-dimensional graphs of, um, the dependence of concentrations and reaction rates on, um, 
of variation. So within the system, we can also make it a little bit more interesting and ask, how, does, how, do, these metab how, how do these critical phenotypes, for instance, TS and ICART, for instance, how do they depend on the actual activity of the enzymes, of, of a couple of these enzymes in the pathway? The system is highly nonlinear. Okay, so, so here's methionine synthase, for instance, at 100% is where, where the wild type lives. So the, 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 these are just graphs. The, the white dot indicates where the wild type normally lives. Uh, and you can see that these are very nonlinear surfaces. And the wild type normally lives on these very flat horizontal regions of, the, of these, these phenotypic landscapes. So this is genotype on, this, on, the, on, the, on the X and Y axis, and phenotype, if you will, on the, on the Y axis. So for a lot of genetic variation, you get around the wild type, you get very little phenotypic variation. That is what we normally would call robustness. Uh, and we can plot these landscapes, and, and so they tend to be flat. And what we can do now is we can take those, that, that table of mutations that I showed you with these big, big functional effects at the genetic level and plot those on these landscapes and see where they fall. And they all fall on the relatively flat portions of those, of those phenotypic landscapes. In other words, even though these mutations, these, these SNPs, have a big effect at the functional level, they have almost very, they have very little or almost no effect at the phenotypic level, okay? And so this is what, well, there's some that, some that are right on the edge, right? And so, so there's a slight effect here, and those are the ones that, under some circumstances, you would think would predispose to disease, because if you live on this part of the landscape and something else happens, you might fall off the cliff, and now you get the, now, and now you get the disease. But these are the kinds of things that, that evolutionary biologists call cryptic genetic variation, okay? It's cryptic at the phenotypic level, big effects at the, at the genetic level, hardly any effect at all at the phenotypic, the phenotypic level. And the shape of those surfaces, the flatness uh, of, the, of those surfaces, depends entirely on the, that, that, that array of allosteric interactions that I was just showing you. How do we know that? Again, in the mathematical model, we can take those reactions out one by one. And if we knock those out, then the following happens. So here, the, 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 the surfaces that I showed you on the previous slide are now in gray here. And here, we're just taking, uh, I didn't write that on here. We just took one of those allosteric interactions and, and, and turned it off. And what it does is it, tilt, it, tilt, it, it now tilts the surface. It tilts the relationship between genotype and phenotype. And genes that were previously without phenotypic effect now are all of a sudden on a landscape where they do have, phen have a phenotypic effect. Okay, so their phenotypic effect becomes revealed. So this is why if you have a mutation somewhere else in the system, you can all of a sudden become sensitive to genes that you were carrying before to which you, to which you were insensitive. So the, 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 and this contributes to the idea of why you need multiple hits very often uh, for, uh, in, in, in different genes in a system for a particular disease to, be, to be become evident. And also, if you live over here, as I said, if you live close to the cliff, um, then some other perturb perturbation in the system that might tilt that landscape is going to make these individuals more prone to fall to, to be on a steep slope now than the individuals who are already, already a little bit closer to the, to the wild type. Okay? So that's where the predisposition to, to, to disease would come from. Uh, we can ask the same question about environmental. You know, the um, environmental factors also affect the, the slopes and the shapes of these, of these landscapes. Okay? So here is again, so for the ICART reaction as a function of pimidylate synthase and MTHFR activity, there is a wild type. These are known polymorphisms for those two genes. They don't vary all that much, but, and there's that same landscape again. If you have a folate deficiency, that landscape tilts tremendously. And now these things which, which projected over a very small range of the phenotypic axis, they'll project over a much larger range and they have a phenotypic effect that wasn't there before, okay? Same thing with vitamin B12 deficiency, and this is for now for the uh, DNA methyl transfer uh, reaction, again, as a function of those same two, two genes, there are polymorphisms there. If we give this individual a vitamin B12 deficiency, there's, that's the same landscape in gray again, the landscape tilts, and now all of a sudden, these genes have a phenotypic effect that wasn't there before. Uh, this is something that's concern of probably about a third of this audience here, including myself. As you get older, uh, we all develop vitamin B12 deficiencies. 
our, intestine, our, our large intestine is really lousy at absorbing this stuff. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, you too. Okay, so, so here's, a, here's, here's something funny you can do with this. Um, so, um, some of you know Alan Rodrigo. He was the, uh, the director of, of the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center. I was talking to him about this, and he says, oh, I had myself sequenced. He says, can you plot me on, me on one of those landscapes? And he's allowing me to share this with you, okay? Um, and so these are the Rodrigo landscapes. There's, there's the wild type, and these, these two dots is where Alan plots out uh, in these things. And he has, uh, he actually has one of his alleles from methionine synthase is, is, is bad, so that falls over here. He has a different mutation in each of his alleles for MTHFR. We don't know how, this in, how those two interact yet, so I just plotted them, plotted them separately. But, but Alan is right on the, uh, he's precariously perched, as we say, right on the edge of these, of these landscapes. Now here's the really cool thing about this. Remember, methionine synthase is the enzyme that has vitamin B12 as a cofactor. Okay. So we can think of this axis, the methionine synthase axis, as an axis of genetic variation, you know, allelic variation in a gene. But it's also equally represented, since, since B12 affects the activity of the enzyme, this could also be a B12 axis. Okay. So, 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 so this axis puts um, genetic variation and environmental variation on the same footing. They have the same effect on this, on this surface. Okay? And so one way in which Alan would be helped, for instance, if, we would imp if he could improve his vitamin B12 status, because that would push, his, push him in that direction. Okay? It would push him closer to, closer to the wild type. And so this is what we're beginning to think of as you know, the, 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 the usefulness of these things might be, is for a kind of a personalized medicine that is rational. In other words, I mean, these are all metabolic systems. The interventions are dietary, largely. You take more vitamins or you take less vitamins. You can also go in the, in the opposite direction. And we can use these models to predict what, what given particular genetic circumstances would allow you to move closer to, in, in, into a safer region of this, of this parameter space. Okay. Um, oops, hold on, I'm going ahead. All right, so here's another evolutionary story uh, to tell. Um, so th these are uh, some ways in which this meta metabolite acetonosyl methionine, which is the, 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 the universal methyl donor for a lot of these methyl, there are about 150 different methyl transfer reactions here that aren't drawn, but they, the cell can turn those on and off. And SAM is the, 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 the donor for that. But SAM is an inhibitor, allosteric inhibitor of MTHFR. It's an inhibitor of DHMT. It's an activator of CBS. And this metabolite, 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate, this folate is an inhibitor of this GNMT reaction. It turns out, and this is something we discovered fairly early on, is that that stability of that DNA methyl transfer reaction, okay, depends critically on having on having all, all these interactions in place. Okay? Um, and we began to wonder why that would be, because you know, when you have this crisscrossing of these regulatory interactions, from an evolutionary perspective, you cannot think, I mean, those did not all arise all at once, or out of nothingness. They must have arisen in some sequence where each addition would have had some benefit to the, to the organism. And so we decided to see if there was a way in which we could deduce the sequence in which these allosteric interactions might have evolved, okay? And we did this as follows. Um, and so we, we looked at how, how sensitive the system is to methionine, to methionine input, that's one of the, one of the methyl donors, and, and look at the, at, the, at the rate of the methylation reaction. Uh, the green is if both CBS and MTHFR are being regulated, and if we turn off the regulation of both of those genes, we get this red, we get this red curve. So you can see it's, it's very robust, very stable in the presence of those regulations. It's very sensitive to methionine input in the absence of those regulations. Now we can put them in one by one. If we put in MTHFR regulation only, we get this effect over here. We almost get a complete rescue of that phenotype. And if we put in only a CBS regulation, we get less of an effect, okay? And so we, we interpreted this as meaning that the CBS reaction probably evolved first because you get some benefit out of it. And then, after, and then the, the MTHFR regulation evolved 
next because then you get extra benefit out of it. Because had this one evolved first, you would have gotten all the benefit you were ever going to get. And adding CBS regulation to it wouldn't get you much except an exceptionally low methionine inputs. So the logic is you know, the, 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 that the order would have been this regulation first, that regulation first, that, okay? Now, you can, and we haven't gotten there yet. We, we, we think we might be able to test this by looking at, uh, because you know, the, the, each of these genes had, had, has evolved a special binding site for SAM. Okay? And there might be a way uh, through, 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 through a genomic analysis to see when those, if, 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 if we can see, when those binding sites evolved, if we can see that they evolved in the phylogeny in the right sequence. That's one of my, my students is working on that. So here's another cool thing that we can do with this, um, with the system. Uh, remember, there's a folate cycle uh, occurs both in the cytosol and in the mitochondria, okay? And uh, we had learned as we were studying this that two of these enzymes in the mitochondria uh, that, have their that have equal representatives in the, in, in the cytosol are actually turned off in the mitochondria in adult cells, uh, but they're perfectly active in embryonic cells and they're reactivated in cancer cells, okay? So they're turned back on, and we began to wonder, why should that be, okay? And if we, um, if we uh, let's, let's start over here. If we knock out those two genes in the model and just let the model run, the general flux in the model is from an input from glycine around the mitochondria out through serine and into uh, gluconeogenesis, okay? So in the absence of these two enzymes, in, of the, these two genes, the mitochondria are, are basically energy, energy factories, okay? When we turn these two genes on, as we go over here, the reactions actually reverse, and now the input is primarily through serine, and the mitochondria now become exporters of methyl groups in the, in the form of formate, and they become uh, the, the basis for purine and pyrimidine synthesis. And that makes sense is that in embryonic cells and in cancer cells, now your mitochondria are basically fueling DNA synthesis, just like you would want in a, in a heavily, um, in, a, in, a, in a tissue where cell division is really important. Um, so it's again a little insight that we were able to get from the model that would help us sort of interpret why some genes might be expressed in some tissues and not in others, or at some times in development and not at other times in a system that otherwise looks, looks, looks fairly homogeneous. Okay, um, these mathematical models that we work with are deterministic models, okay? So they have particular values for each of the parameters. You can run that model a million times and you'll get the identical result a million times. And we get to be concerned with the fact that no two individuals are alike. There's a lot of variation in our populations. And in fact, if you go to the literature and you try to find the kinetic constants for the enzymes, the Vmaxes or the Kms, there's actually quite a bit of variation in the literature on that, okay? So we, we are not all identical, okay? And so what we decided to do is to see if we can build a population version of this mathematical model for a folate-mediated carbon metabolism by simply introducing random variation in the parameter values for the enzymes, the, 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 the Michaelis constants and the Vmaxes and the rate constants for, for some of the transporters uh, and so forth. Um, and then test that so, so, so we, can, we, can, we can generate an individual, a hypothetical virtual individual with some random perturbations of these, of these parameter values, store them, randomly perturb those parameter values again, generate a new individual, and do that 10,000 times. So we can build up a population of 10,000 virtual individuals, each with parameter values sampled from some, some sort of a small normal distribution and then see what the variation is in the metabolite concentrations, the reaction rates of the enzymes, and test those against human databases, okay? And here's a, so here we test it against the NHANES database. Uh, the NHANES database is, a, is, is, this is a study that has been going on since the 1990s, where they've been measuring metabolite values and dietary inputs for about three to 5,000 people every year. Uh, it's a very rich database. Um, and uh, without fiddling with the model, so the, 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 the pale bars are enhanced data for two, two successive uh, seasons, and uh, the black are the model data for tissue folate, plasma folate, and plasma homocysteine. 
And you can see we get the distributions pretty good with the model, and that is without rigging it, right? So we did not twiddle with the model to get this distribution right. It's because the model was good to start with, because it was so well validated against lots of other data that it simply produced this, you know, this distribution naturally. Okay, so that gives you again some confidence that what we're doing in the model still reflects what is going on in real life, at least to, to, to a reasonable degree. Um, so with this then as, as confidence, we can then say, okay, so now let's take those 10,000 virtual individuals and let's ask questions about this population. How are different traits distributed in this population? Not just the ones that I showed you the, the gene frequencies for, but how are the associations between different things that the different variables that people like to measure and other variables that people are interested in, what are the distributions? What do those associations look like? And the scary thing about that is they're all different and almost none of them is linear. Okay, they're all nonlinear relationships. Um, I'll show you what, what the implications of that are. So here's a, I don't want you to read this. I just want you to look at this, okay? Uh, so this, these are the relationships, the pairwise relationships between Two, two different, you know, two, two different variables or two different outputs, outputs of the model. Um, and in this case, what, what I did is I marked in, uh, in gray the individuals in this virtual population of 10,000 that have a relatively low folate concentration in their blood, and in black the ones that have a relatively high folate concentration in their blood. So these are folate sufficient and folate insufficient uh, individuals. And you can see how they plot out. Some, in, in, in some parameters, they, they split nicely, and sometimes they're, 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 they're curvilinear, uh, curvilinearly associated. Um, if you look at them um, for uh, plasma folate or plasma homocysteine, and you separate those populations, uh, you can get very different relationships between what you think are related, you know, CBS flux and the MTHFR flux, for instance, these are, these are identical mechanisms. The, we didn't change anything in the mechanism. We just selected out of the population individuals that are high plasma folate or low plasma folate. And the correlation between, the, 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 between these parameters is completely different in each one of the populations. There's no correlation at all. There's a negative correlation here, strongly positive correlation here, less weakly positive correlation there, depending entirely on how you selected your population. Okay? There's a big message in this because in an awful lot of association studies that we do, that everybody does, is we take selected population, an experimental population and a control population, something like that, and then we compare them, okay? But because these systems are so horribly nonlinear, the association that you're going to find will depend entirely on how you sample that population. Okay? That, that's, a, that's a really, really important, important message. How am I doing on time? Okay, we're good. All right. So that's one take-home message. Uh, as I mentioned on that very first slide, we've done quite a bit of work on, on dopamine metabolism. The pathway is a little bit simpler. There are fewer, uh, fewer enzymes, fewer metabolites. It has several, two interesting uh, regulatory mechanisms, uh, this pathway. Uh, so dopamine is synthesized from tyrosine by tyrosine hydroxylase. It's packaged into vesicles, and it's excreted upon the receipt of, of action potentials. And this is the extracellular dopamine. Uh, dopamine is a f funny neurotransmitter, just like serotonin. It is not a one-for-one -one neurotransmitter, like I said with choline, but it does what is called volume transmission. What, this, what the system tries to do is to maintain a stable concentration of dopamine in the, in the synaptic area, and that controls sort of the, 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 the tenor of downstream, downstream signaling, okay, called volume transmission. So, so, this, so, so the system is trying to stabilize this, the, the system, and there are two ways of doing that. Uh, there's a reuptake transporter, just like with serotonin, that removes stuff, removes dopamine from the system, repackages it, and resecretes re it. So every time there's an action potential, we put some out and recycle it. And there is an autoreceptor. So there's a, there's a presynaptic uh, receptor for dopamine on the presynaptic membrane that affects the rate at which synaptic vesicles release and affect the rate at which thymidylase synthase, uh, uh, sorry, at which uh, tyrosine hydroxylase uh, catalyzes that first step in, in, in dopamine synthesis. And both of those serve as regulators. And again, we can um, remodel that. Uh, you know, we're, we're collaborating with some, some lovely clinicians that, that work on this. Um, 
And so we, we asked the question, uh, we were got interested in, in Parkinson's disease. So, so, so the dopaminergic neurons in the brain only occur in a very small part of the, of, of the brain stem, the, the, the substantia nigra. It's a very small cluster of cells, only a few hundred thousand cells uh, in there. Uh, it's a black area of the brain. It's black because one of the breakdown products of dopamine is, uh, is, is melanin. And so it shows where the, where the, where the dopamine are, where do dopamine neurons are. And the cells in the substantia nigra gradually die. In young people, they're still mostly alive. In old people, they're mostly dead, actually. So they, they, they die at a, at a particular rate. Uh, the more die, the more likely you are to develop Parkinsonian. Uh, this, uh, symptoms because that 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 concentration is not stable. It's not stable anymore. Okay, and so the downstream tone of the downstream of the, of the regulated muscles uh, is not as accurate uh, anymore. Okay, um, it is known from autopsy studies that uh, people with Parkinsonian symptoms or pre-Parkinsonian symptoms have lost about eighty percent of the cells in their substantia nigra. Okay. And so we're good for a good long time. Uh, at least I hope so. And so what we did is we we model we, we have a really good mathematical model for this, where in which we can actually model cell death. Okay, we can kill off progressively more dopaminergic cells in the substantia nigra, and then ask the question: What is the what effect does it have on the con extracellular concentration of dopamine? And we can see here that the model shows that as we kill off more and more cells, nothing much happens until we get about 80% of the cells killed, and now it becomes suddenly very bad. That extra 20% that extra loss makes a big difference, okay? And we can demonstrate that, that a lot of that effect is due to the uh, activity of the, the proper activity of the reoptic transporter, because if that reoptic transporter wasn't working, we get an almost linear, linear relationship between fractions of cell alive uh, cells alive and the extracellular concentration of dopamine. So we can demonstrate that this reoptic transporter you know, performs this, this very critical function for, the, for stabilizing the extracellular dopamine. Okay? It turns out that, that in this system there's actually a, there are a lot of, uh, just, like, just like I showed you in the, um, in the folate, in the folate one carbon metabolism system, there's an enormous amount of standing genetic variation for tyrosine hydroxylase. There's a good bit for, for, the, for the reoptic transporter. We know what, how those mutations affect the activities. And here's how they plot on the dopamine landscape. There's the wild type. Uh, we have some overexpression and underexpression studies. And you can see again that these things tend to, you know, the, 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 the mutations tend to live in areas where the extracellular dopamine is relatively insensitive to variation in uh, tyrosine hydroxylase activity or in activity of the, of the reoptic uh, transporter. Okay? So again, uh, th th it's again an explanation of why these otherwise deleterious genes can be maintained in the population, even though you can detect them by association studies as having a very small effect, okay? and more so of an effect if something else is wrong with you. And so here's that same surface again, and if we take out for instance, if, if, we, if we decrease the effect of the autoreceptor, that was that other, that other feedback regulator in here, now you can see that this formerly flatter landscape now tilts rather more severely. And so, if we, so, and, and so now all of a sudden, if we have some defect in the autoreceptor, now the effect of variation in the reoptic transporter becomes much more severe, okay? And you, you have disease. Do I have a few more minutes? Okay, I'm going to tell you one last story, quite unrelated to all these, these other things, but I think you'll be, you might be interested in this, who knows? I could be mistaken. So I mentioned that we did a, a, quite a bit of work on acetaminophen uh, toxicity. Uh, you all know about acetaminophen, it's the active ingredient in Tylenol. Uh, after Mike and I did this work, the first thing we did is we flushed all our Tylenol down the toilet. Uh, and here's why. Uh, it's immensely toxic. Uh, there are 56,000 in the United States, the emergency department visits, 26,000 hospitalizations, 500 deaths per year due to uh, acetaminophen overdose. Um, the reason for that is that the, the range between the therapeutic dose and the fatal dose is very, very narrow, okay? So that's the recommended dose that's on the bottle. If you take 
triple that dose, you will very likely suffer very severe liver damage and possibly liver, possibly liver, liver failure. A lot of those, about half the deaths actually, about a third of the deaths are actually intentional uh, associated with uh, overdoses. It's a, it's a common uh, suicide way to commit suicide. Uh, remember the guy that um, sent those anthrax envelopes around the country about four or five years ago, okay? And the FBI was after him, and they cornered him somewhere in Colorado, I think. And he committed suicide with, uh, with Tylenol, actually. So it, it, it does work. Um, so here's how it works. It, it's, it's really insidious. It's, it's, it's the weirdest thing. APAP, that is sort of the, the, the scientific abbreviation for, for acetaminophen, is actually a very nice, it's not toxic at all. It's a very nice, very nice compound. The minute it enters the liver, it begins to be uh, metabolized. And there are three met metabolic pathways. It's sulfonated by adding a sulfur to it. It's glucuronidated by adding a glucose to it. And it is acted on by one of the P450 uh, cytochromes that hydroxylates it, and that turns it into a tremendously toxic compound. Okay? And NAPQI is what it's called for short. And NAPQI is very reactive. It undergoes covalent binding to tons of proteins in the liver and basically kills, kills cells. Normally, it's inactivated by glutathione. GSH is glutathione, the stuff that I told you about in our first, in a, in our first model. As long as you have plenty of glutathione in your liver, you can inactivate all this stuff. You pee it out, basically. Okay, you, you conjugate it. Uh, what is cute about this is that these P450 enzymes are normally there in the liver. We've got quite a few of them to detoxify things. That's what they're for. Okay? And, and perversely, they take a, in this particular case, they take a perfectly innocuous compound and make it into a horribly toxic uh, one, at least ever so briefly. But whether it's toxic to you depends on how much GSH, how much glutathione you can produce. Okay? So we built a mathematical model for it. Uh, and this is just to show you uh, against, so in the mathematical model, we can give it a, an APAP dose and look at, the, at, the, at these conjugates, how they appear in the blood, and compare that to experimental data as a timeline. We can also do dose response studies, so there, there are the experimental data, these are the model results, where here we're looking at the degree of covalent binding that happens, so the degree to which you know, it's actually killing cells, and the actual glutathione concentration in the liver. You can see that if you have a high enough dose, you can actually overcome the capacity of the liver to produce enough glutathione, and that's when it becomes toxic. Okay, and that's why that's where that you know that 20 pill dose actually will totally deplete glutathione in your liver, and will start that's when you start killing your liver cells. Okay, and so putting that in the model, we got our hands on a on a, a, a population a, 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 um, a population of individuals from a, an emergency room in Utah. Uh, in which it was known or it was estimated what kind of a dose they had taken uh, and at what time they arrived at the emergency room. In the emergency room, you are given the, the typical antidote is n acetylcysteine uh, And cysteine is one, of the, I mean, uh, is one of the components of glutathione. Glutathione is three amino acids with a cysteine in the middle. Cysteine is a rare amino acid. And so the, the, the rationale is that that is what you're really depleting is cysteine. And you give somebody the when you emerge, come into an emergency room with a, a, a Tylenol overdose, you're given the largest dose of anacetylcysteine that you can tolerate. And, and this is just simply the time at which it was given that dose. And the blue points are, the, are, are, are data that indicate individuals that lived and dead ones that did not, that did not survive. And the model, the, the curve here is the, is the separation of the model of when there are fewer than 30% hepatocytes left. And 30% and of hepatocytes is thought to be sort of the lethal, the, the, the lethal limit. And that comes from, from studies of liver transplant and liver resection studies. That if you, you can tolerate about 60 to 70% removal of your liver, and 30% of, of it is enough to regenerate, to, to, to reestablish a new liver, but not much more. So that's why we took that as, a, as sort of our cutoff. And you can see it separates the, 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 the predicted lethality uh, and, and the predicted effectiveness of this of this dose this dose pretty nicely. That guy nobody would ever have predicted, no matter what. And these guys are, are right in the middle of the. You know, there must have been something else wrong with these two individuals, uh, possibly alcoholics, uh, possibly other reasons for having you know, uh, for having an, 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 an inadequate liver. Oh, by the way, that P450 is also upregulated by alcohol. It's, it, it detoxifies alcohol, right? 
which is why they tell you don't take alcohol when you take your Tylenol. Right? There's a reason for this. Makes it even worse. Okay, I'll stop there then. I was going to show you some cool things, but let me, let me just show you the conclusions. We think of these regulatory mechanisms in these metabolic systems as homeostatic mechanisms, just like you have homeostatic mechanisms in physiology. These are dynamic systems that stabilize phenotype against all kinds of environmental variation that happens on short and long term scales, and which at the same time is protective against genetic variations that occur on a much longer time scale. They're widespread and diverse. They allow the accumulation of mutations that have, may have large effects at the functional level, but little effect at phenotypes. And that cryptic variation, cryptic genetic variation, is abundant in human systems. And we think we can explicitly understand how that operates, why that is there. And it can predispose to disease because other genetic environmental variables can disrupt that system, tilt the landscapes, and now you're, now you're ill. And this just acknowledges all my collaborators and students. Thank you. Okay. Sir. Oh, sorry. So two questions. The first one is, you showed us this graph of the individual variation. It, if I understood you right, you got by adding normal variation in the activity mm -hmm. of the enzymes. Um, did you tune the variance of that to make it fit? Or Well, hey, that's an interesting problem because we, we got a log normal distribution, as you probably noticed, right? Well, you uh, ended up with a log normal distribution. What? You, you ended up with something that yeah. looked not log yeah. normal, but... but uh, pretty, pretty close to log normal, that because, because most of these reactions are multiplicative. But how did you how did you pick the variance in the underlying parameters? Oh, we that we did to to get the spread. Get the spread, not okay. the shape. To get the spread. Yeah, right. right. Okay. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. other question is, um, so are there rare mutants that have uh, that are farther out on these surfaces? Uh, uh, yeah. Where you would say, well, the mutants there, but it's getting selected out. Um, they are. They're actually inside there because they're all in these, you know, in, in these two-dimensional graphs. They're, they're, they're all on the flat of the scape, so they're all within normal variation, even though, again, at the functional level, they have big effects. We, we put that in, and we can put them in these, these, these populations. We put some, pre, some the known frequency of those, you know, of, those, of those SNPs. And they always fall near a tail, but well within the, within the distribution that we, that, 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 that we no detect. No killers. Pardon me? No killer mutations. No, no killer mutations. Um, what we do get are combinations of mutations. Okay, occasionally we get we get an outlier, and then we can figure out you know why it, why it is that he that he was an outlier, and it's not because of that mutation, but because a per peculiar combination of, with other things. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Hi, um, I was wondering, with everything that you've worked on, what is what is it that you want to come out of this? What's the change that you want to see take place because of all your work? Well, I'll tell you why this started for me, because what, what I really wanted originally was a system in which I could study the entire causal chain between genotype and phenotype, right? And not simply, you know, so where, 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 where you could actually have a complete explanation for why a mutation would produce that particular phenotypic defect or change. Okay, and I spent a lot of time doing this in, in developmental systems where there's simply not enough kinetic information known, and so that's why I ended up with these metabolic systems. Then they turned out to have a life of their own, and they turned out to have many more interesting implications than I had started out with, like the ones that I just showed you. With you know, that they, they, they allow us to say something interesting about cryptogenetic variation and why it is there and why it wouldn't be selected against, or at least invisible, it's invisible to, uh, to, to selection. Um, we're interested in the evolution of these systems now, obviously, uh, because we know that there's so much variation in them in, in, in natural populations, and we want to know what the, you know, where that, we want to know where the allosteric interactions come from in the first place, how have they evolved, 
the systems are very ancient. Uh, they like to have one carbon metabolism. That goes all the way down to bacteria, but with modifications. And so you can actually plot, you know, one of my students is working on this. You can actually plot the evolution of these networks uh, in some way on a, on a phylogeny and see why, at, at what point things got added or reactions, reactions were dropped or new, new metabolites came in or new enzymes came in. And then the question is, what, what did they get out of that? Right? Why, did, why did that happen? What was the gain? And, and so, so we're interested in those kinds of evolutionary questions. And in terms of evolutionary medicine, we think that these are actually useful um, di you know, diagnostics, like the Rodrigo landscapes, where we can tell Alan that he should eat more steak. Right? I mean, you know, we, we, we can do some intervention, we, we can do rational interventions, gentle, gentle rational interventions that don't involve genetic engineering, but involve, you know, dietary interventions that might help, might help people. And we can do this because we're beginning to get pretty confident about that we've got it right. So these are mathematical models that matter. Thank you so much, Fred. He'll be back in February for our conversation. Uh -huh.